O come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the risen Christ. Be with us today and always. Be our light, our guide, and our comforter. Be our strength, our courage, and our sanctifier. May this new year be a time of deep spiritual growth for us, a time of welcoming your graces and gifts, a time for forgiving freely and unconditionally, a time for growing in virtue and goodness. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us today and always. Amen. 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 So, last night... <clears throat> Um, I was talking with uh, Beth, and uh, <clears throat> we were trying to decide on having service or not. Um, she really liked the idea of having a service for the last day of the year, the last night of the year. So I'm glad we're here. Um, but I didn't really have anything kind of prepared for. New Year's Eve like um, work. <coughs> so I just said, all right, I'll talk with God and kind of figure it out. In the back of my mind, I was thinking, okay, well, I already have James 5 through 8 pretty much mapped out and ready to go, so I can just go along with that and not have to uh, prepare too much for it and, and be good. Um, but I decided to. <coughs> <clears throat> to pray on it and talk to God about it and kind of see uh, if that was his plan or if that was just my plan. Clearly it was just my plan. Um, so I started diving into the Word and, and talking with God and um, I came across quite a few verses. Instead of just ignoring them, I wrote them down and I'll um, say some of them here this evening. Um but one that just kept coming back to me was Galatians 6, 9. And, um, Matt, you can remember Galatians 6, 9. I think you were there that evening downtown with the homeless, um, who I still think was an angel that we ran into at the end of the street on 16th, that told, told us right, right when we were debating if we were going to keep doing Super Knot at one point midway through, I think it was two years in, maybe a year and a half in, and gentleman on the bench we'd never seen before said you guys are Galatians 6 um, and then he told us the verse and um, that verse had stuck with me really ever since um, and it's been pretty much burning in me for quite a while I've mentioned it I think a couple different times but never really uh, thought about bringing the word to it so I started doing some research on that and doing some preparing <coughs> on Galatians 6 9 and um, that was, again, I think part of my plan, not so much God's plan for tonight. So he brought me in a completely different direction um, really late last night. So it's kind of going to be going bouncing around and kind of going all over the place. So kind of bear with. Um, I wrote down most of the, I think all the verses uh, in my notes so that I don't have to go back and forth through the Bible because there's, be bouncing around all over the place. I'll reference them, so if you're taking notes, feel free to write them down. Or if you're on a phone and able to keep up quickly, then that would be fine too, which is even better. Yeah, which is good. Um, so first, first off, so I was doing research on New Year's Eve. Um, wanted to get a little bit of more understanding, get some quotes from New Year's Eve. Um, there's a lot of famous quotes about New Year's Eve from a lot of famous people. Um, a few of them I liked and a few of them I didn't. But uh, first one here is Jonathan Edward says, Resolution 1, I will live for God. Revolution, resolution two, 2, if no one else does, I still will. I thought that was really good. Um, then another one. From uh, Chuck Swindle, if you're running a 26-mile marathon, remember that every mile 
is run one step at a time. If you're writing a book, do it one page at a time. If you're trying to master a new language, try it one word at a time. There are 365 days in the average year. Divide any project by 365 and you'll find that no job is all that intimidating. And another one from Martin Luther. Glory to God in highest heaven, who unto man his son hath given. While angels sing with tender mirth, a glad new year to all the earth. So, um, it also um, looked up the, go to the meaning. I didn't type it in. I say write down my notes. I don't write. Who am I kidding? I type it into a computer um, <laughs> so that I can reread it again. Because I have sloppy handwriting. But um, I didn't type it in into the um, document that I was working on. But a lot had to do with Julius Caesar um, from like 56 BC. Um, <coughs> back in 56 BC, a gentleman, I didn't write it down or type it in who it was, but had um, declared that uh, January 1st um, was going to be the new year, a new calendar year, and Julius Caesar had declared that years later, um, but in order to fall in with the sun and the moon and to fit just right for his calendar, he waited extra days, and the previous year had been 440-something days as opposed to the 365 that we have today, but the new calendar, the Julius calendar, made January 1st the new year. A um, few verses that, uh, that came up as I was doing research on here is 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Psalms 20 Verse 4, may he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all of your purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's right. In Philippians 3, 13 and 14, this is in the King James, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now when I got to this verse, um, it actually hit me a little bit harder than the other ones um, that God wanted me to kind of dive into this a little bit more and take this a little bit further. In the NIV, it's another good translation, it's uh, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenly word in Christ Jesus. So, only a few people can do more than one thing at a time. This cord is having problems, especially us men. There's more men in here than women tonight. I didn't foresee that. It's a proven fact that ladies are multitasking and more multi-talented, sometimes even multi-personality. <laughs> Just kidding. Most people never become proficient in more than one trade or occupation. This may be a jack of all. There may be, I got thought of Jerry as he's kind of a jack of all trades. He can do everything, but usually only a master of one. The mind can only truly focus on one line of thought at a time. And by the time a person reaches their mid teens, they're usually settled in one pattern of lifestyle. Ideally, we get on track and we focus on one thing. <coughs> And we can achieve much when we're focused on one. So that's kind of what I wanted to kind of talk about and teach about tonight is just one thing. 
which shouldn't take very long, it's just one thing, right? And then it got me to think of City Slickers, the movie. Um, uh, the, the, they were searching pretty much the entire movie for just one thing. And uh, it took an entire movie to, uh, to get to that. But I won't take an entire movie tonight, even though we have lots of time. Um, so the one thing I do is overcoming the past, which is Philippians 3.13 and 14 really talks about. The past has passed. So let's get past it, right? It's so simple to say. Paul is looking back over his life as he is writing. He knows that his past is not worthy to steal from the present or from the future. I have some reservations about people who get saved from a wicked past life and then immediately write their life story. They get expounding over several hundred pages of their past sin. It's easy to kind of talk about everything of the past because it's happened and we've lived it. But then on the very last page, they'll bring it to the climax with a brief statement concerning their salvation experience of how they got saved, when they got saved, that exact moment. We've talked about that in, in different um, in teachings that, of that being in that moment, that moment of when you were saved, that moment when you first felt the Holy Spirit in you, right? So if someone is to write their, um, <clears throat> their, their experience, and once they got to that point, the majority of that book or that writing would be about their past, the sins that they've done, they've lived through, the things that they didn't do that they wish they had, bringing up just so much negative things. And then one little um, spot at the very end of that book or the end of the page would talk about that moment that we talked about before, that um, salvation moment. Why not expound on salvation and the grace of God and let the past life be forgotten. That's what Paul is applying here. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Defeat comes from dwelling on the past. We know this to be true. You can't live yesterday over again, even though we seem to try. Dr. J. Howard, or Harold Smith, who is the founder of uh, the Bible Hour, used to say he never gives his life story because he would have to bring up his past sins. The Bible tells us that God has forgotten them, so why bring them up again? Peter Marshall, who's a famous preacher from the early 1900s, I think he was born in 1909, he had said, Never let the past be so dear as to limit the future. The past is, is a hard subject to go through and... and, and and talk about, and preach about. Um, I think it's natural for ourselves to think about the past, of what we've had to overcome, or what we haven't overcome yet that we're dealing with today because of the past, or what we didn't accomplish. I saw off subject here, but um, I was on uh, Facebook earlier um, today at work, and there were so many um, resolutions that people are talking about that they, um, one was, uh, my resolution for 2015 is for everything that I didn't do for 2014. Another one that I saw was, my resolution for 2015 is um, to go, go back and, and from 2011 through 2014 uh, accomplish all the things that I didn't yet do. Um, it got me thinking, going through a lot of these posts that are on in social media, that so many people have their mind and their hearts really on the past. They're, they haven't moved forward. They haven't put closure on things that they didn't accomplish yet or put closure on the things that did happen that may have negatively affected them. So how do we overcome the past? Well, Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You must bury those past memories of the old life. Hebrews 11, 15 
says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Abraham and Sarah did not discuss the old life prior to their encounter with the Lord. You and I must also adopt that same policy. Uh, Luke 9, 62 and Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It's pretty powerful. This is a race we are running, so we must focus on the goal, or we'll get tripped up. One thing I know is overcoming doubt. John 9.25 He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. You'll notice I took a lot of, I retranslated a lot of these just to the, the, the King James. I think King James' words in this instance speak more powerfully. Um, but, Whereas I was blind, now I see. This is talking about settling your assurance of salvation. Two factors that give this man his assurance of salvation. Number one, he says, I was blind. He admits his condition. A lost person must admit he is a sinner. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes it's not. Number two, now I see. He accepted the cure. A person must accept what Christ has done on the cross for the redemptions of sin. That part I find very challenging. Because we start putting doubt into our minds of, oh, I didn't deserve that. God didn't do that for me, for this specific sin that I'm battling. It's very, very challenging to, in some minds, to allow the idea that you deserved it for not having to do anything, right? But that's what salvation is. But mankind attempts to make salvation too complicated. We like to, I think Andy said this a lot, muddy the waters, right? There's always someone who comes to the new convert and questions his experience. It's very easy to question it. John 9, 19. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? And how doth he now see? Again, I like the King James. It's one advantage I have the, when I'm working on the, the computer and putting these together is having all translations really at my fingertips. Um, the Bible app on the phone is very convenient for that. Because you can read multiple versions um, and read them out loud. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, then hear how it comes across. But many various religious associations, certain happenings with salvation, a chilling feeling or an uncontrollable situation that accompanies salvation that is not biblical. Salvation is trusting Christ's work on the cross. Every Christian must settle this one thing, that doubt is the one major reason for Christian failure. <coughs> now, doubts can come from multiple sources. These are the two that, that I've written down. From God, to provoke the salvation of a lost person, some conviction, or from Satan to paralyze the service of a believer that God is not the author of confusion. So settle in your heart today. <coughs> Billy Sunday said, With Christ you are saved. Without him you are lost. Now that is the right approach. Let's say it again. With Christ 
you are saved. Without him, you are lost. Do you have him? And if so, you are saved. If not, then you are lost. There's so many songs that we sing that really display that or say that. And when, when you're singing them with just words, it comes across as just words. Words that you're reading. Words that you're singing from a song. But you can sing it when you believe it and it's in your heart. That with Christ you are saved, without him you are lost. One thing that you are lacking, overcoming the world. Mark 10, 21-22 Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross, and follow me. And he has, and he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now I believe if he had agreed to this, Jesus would have added that it is not necessary. What is important is the heart attitude toward those things. It's an area that I had struggled for quite some time with, with treasures. That I had much value into treasures. This man had great possessions. There was one thing between him and Jesus. Now, actually, there was many things between him and Jesus. One was great material possessions. A lot of us can relate to that. The fact that he was a good man. That the fact he had kept all of his commandments, <coughs> we learn in verse 20, um, that he feared God and that he was moral. Yet Jesus told him that there was one thing that was missing, or what I like in King James, one thing thou lackest. But that was neat. And people today know that there's something missing. They feel the emptiness. They sense the void. It's our job to show them how to fill it and be fulfilled. That was one thing that when I talked with Andy, uh, we, when we were praying Tuesday nights prior to um, going downtown, was that it's our job to show them how to fill it and to be fulfilled. It wasn't our job to, to do much of really anything else. The man considered Jesus, um, his Jesus' command, an impossibility. There are, are there any here today that are so motivated by worldly things that you won't really listen to what God is saying to you? That was a question I had to ask myself quite a few times, and there was many times I had to say no. That, no, I'm not listening because I'm so focused and it's so loud of all the worldly things that I'm more concerned about. And it's even harder to do that when rent isn't being able to be paid, bills aren't able to be made, made on time, <clears throat> Someone very close to you is very sick, or any other distraction that the world has to offer to us. When our focus is so much involved into the worldly things, and there's so many things that we can't hear what God is trying to say to us. So maybe we're just holding on to just one too many things. Someday you're going to go away sad, as did this young man did with Jesus. And thing number four is one thing is needful. And that's overcoming monotony. 
Luke 10, 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So in that text, Jesus has come for a visit, and Martha is busy serving. But Mary is at his feet worshiping. Martha's not too happy about this, changing pots and pans, clearing her voice, a little help. Martha's not too Mary. Mary is M-E-R-R-Y, not M-A-R-Y. But Mary, M-A-R-Y, is doing what's important. Too many of us, myself, live like we're on a leash and someone else is in control. We do what's urgent and not what's important. There are too many important things that are being sacrificed on the altar of urgent. I was thinking about this quite a bit that you know with work, with job things or things with on um, deadlines. Um, but my my boss and I were discussing one of our um, employees that is a great employee. He's young. He's 22, I think 23, very young. Um, this is his first real job that he's had. Um, he's pretty fresh out of college, very intelligent, um, and he's good at what he does. But one thing that, um, that my boss had asked me to help him with is he, he's so focused on a task that when something more important comes up, He doesn't really focus on it because his urgency is on the task that he'd already been working on, right? So if, if uh, my boss would give him a, a task, something silly that's really not that important, but he sees it as important because his boss is asking him to look something up, he'll drop what he's doing that maybe was more important because he'll go towards the urgency because his boss is telling him, hey, can you look this up for me? And in my boss's mind, he may be thinking, at your earliest convenience, when you're not doing anything, when you have some downtime, can you look up this information and get it to me? But his mind is on what's urgent and not necessarily what's so important. Psalm 27, 4, says this, One thing that uh, I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Now that speaks some spiritual focus. Second Peter 3.8 But beloved, be not ignorant for this one thing, that one day is, the, is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. We feel we have many days and many, many things to do, but spiritual focus will keep us on task of what's truly important. I find this to be extremely true, that I had many, many, many things going on in my mind late last night, including Lakaya, who had broken out with some type of rash. He was red all over and had some white spots kind of going on. He was crying and complaining that it was itchy and kind of hurting. It was heated, so I had him take a shower to kind of um, take off the lotion that he had put on there. Maybe that was bothering him. <clears throat> um, and then he wanted to um, snuggle with me and hang out with me while he was in this pain. And Kelsey had me, uh, given him a Benadryl, so I knew he'd be knocked out just soon, um, which is to an advantage. But I had Lakaya having some medical problems going on, which turned out to be okay as of this morning. Um, I had um, New Year's Eve. I had work going on in my mind. I had lots and lots of lots of lots of things going on in my mind. But what was important was being in the Word and talking with God about what He wants 
me to talk about today. There was a lot of worry in my mind of who was going to show up tonight. Of is it even worth putting this together for just myself to go through. There was a lot of things, a lot of useless, but what I thought was important to me, things going on in my mind, but none of that mattered. And when I got to this, and I was reading this and, and discussing this with God, was that if I find myself in a spiritual focus, all things will be handled by Him. That I don't have to worry, as He says in uh, Matthew, that don't worry about t- uh, tomorrow, as tomorrow will handle itself. Then why worry and allow Him to take that burden off of us? So, I carefully took the worries out of my mind as to all the things that were racing through my mind and worrying about Lakaya, worrying about everything else. It's 1.30 in the morning, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I got into a spiritual focus. Now, a lot of us get into that spiritual focus in completely different ways. Music is one way that I'm able to get into worship with Him and, and then diving into the Word where, where the music kind of leads me to. Um, some it's just deep, deep, deep prayer, which in some cases I can get into that as well. And, um, but usually it's worship music and worshiping with Him that gets me into that deep prayer to talk with Him. But whatever it is, and we, we know what that is that gets us there, get into that spiritual focus. The spiritual focus is what's truly important. Jesus rebuked Martha for her spiritual ignorance. Jesus told her, Mary hath chosen that good part as she sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Let's face it, we can't do it all. So let's make sure we're doing what's most important. Certainly there's a much of servings and services that need to be done, but worship must take first priority. It's better to just do one thing and do it well. I think I've heard that in sports all my life. Than to have so many irons in the fire that we make a mess of what we're, of all that we're doing, right? So I get the visual of the of the whole juggling act that I can juggle one ball up and down pretty darn well. I'm going to say, I can handle that. Give me two. It's a little bit more challenging. I can probably do it for a while, but eventually my focus will be more so on one ball than the other and maybe drop it. Give me three or more balls, I can't do it. Forget about it. (laughs) Forget about it. I've tried to learn. I've tried and tried. I've watched tapes. Um... It's VHS tapes. <coughs> Put them in s- <coughs> slow motion, and, and really the slow motion of VHS, VHS is very slow. And I tried watching professional jugglers, and I just can't do it. I don't have that skill. So I get that visual when I, when I'm, when I, get, when I was reading that and going through that. I get that visual. It's better to do just one thing and do it well than to have many irons in the fire that will just mess everything up. <coughs> and remember, the, the physical passes away and the spiritual abides forever. Right? The physical passes away and the spiritual abides forever. 2 Corinthians 4.18 While we look not at all things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Right? I remember Jerry's message on that not that long ago. Pretty pretty vividly. Um, So let's not wind up on our deathbed having been led around by our necks. I picture uh, Chloe on a leash of monotony. Let's take charge 
of our lives and live abundantly, focusing on what's important, what makes a difference, both now and today, while we're here, and eternally, which is ultimately what our focus is on completely, right? 